Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm your host, Debbie warhurst Cap, along with gardening expert, David Yost. And we've got a very special guest today, don't we, oh, David? We sure do. Special guest and a special show, Dr. Michael Goatley from Virginia Tech. Uh, well, you are a turf grass professor. I am, David. Thank you all for having me. Oh, so Absolutely. glad you could be here. Now, how many years have you been at Tech? I've been at Tech, tech about 10 and a half years now. Yeah. So it's time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> oh, it does. So, uh, you know, Dr. Michael has been on the program here with us before. You know, and that's where a lot of times, you know, I'm referring about the field trials that are down there. You're down there evaluating the different turf grass varieties doing research and teaching, right? Big part of their program is what types of grasses, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today is what type of grasses should we be trying to grow again here now that September has arrived. Yeah, exactly. As you mentioned, September has arrived, and I'm saying uh, September is the month out of the year if you're going to be working in your lawn. So what's in store for us today? Well, we're going to talk about seeding, so with a little bit on renovation. We're going to talk about fertilization for the fall and what we should be doing now because we can actually make our lawns better for 2015 if we do our efforts here in the fall. So we're going to really emphasize lots of things that we should be doing at this time of year. Oh, so glad you could be here to share all that with us. Uh, before we get started, though, I think Debbie's got a few announcements to I share do. with we us. I do. Actually, we've got a lot of announcements today, so let's get started right away. First of all, our seminars today are in full swing. We have three great ones today at our Maryfield location, at the Maryfield Community Hall right next door to the Maryfield location. David and uh, Dr. Goatley are going to rush right out of here after the show, and uh, Dr. Goatley's going to be talking about fall lawn care. So what you don't get here, you can pick up on when you get there with lots more time for questions and you can really go into to a lot more depth. That's at 10 a.m. at the Maryfield location. At our Fair Oaks location, Peg Beer and Stephanie Brock are going to be talking about beautiful displays with bulbs and perennials. So get some color in your, in your landscape, uh, both in the fall and coming up in the spring. And that's at 10 a.m. at Fair Oaks. And at our Gainesville location, Suzanne Conway is going to be talking about ornamental grasses and companion plants. So, so important this time of year. Ornamental grasses are just spectacular. 10 a.m. at our Gainesville location. Next week, we've got three wonderful seminars coming up as well. Tree care, designing gardens with color, and photography and flowers. That's going to be great. Also want to mention, in a couple of weeks, um, on October 4th, we're going to have Ahmad Hassan, excuse me, Ahmed Hassan, celebrity landscaper. He's been with HGTV and DIY's Yard Crashers. He is going to be here doing a seminar at 10 a.m. Well, we've added a seminar at 1 p.m. as well. So I want to let you know about that ahead of time to take advantage of that. So at 10 a.m. and at 1 p.m. on October 4th, he will be here. He also will be here on our show on Maryfield's Gardening Advisor that morning as well. So he's going to have a, a busy morning that, that morning. And then a couple more seminars. Uh, excuse me, a couple more announcements. Uh, let's see, Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, September 24th, at our Fair Oaks location, Stephanie Brock is going to be doing a um, vertical gardening workshop. Now, that, she's done that before, and it's, it's really exciting. She's going to be do two, doing two sessions, 12.30 and 6.30. There is a fee for that, so if you go on our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com, got all the information about that, and we need you to sign up because the space is limited. But it's really a cool thing to do, so take advantage of that. And uh, our new fall hours, since it's getting dark a little earlier now that uh, we will be officially in fall, come uh, Tuesday, I guess? A fall officially starts. So it's getting darker. Uh, we're going to be open until basically from 8 until dark, Monday and Monday through Saturday. Sundays will remain at our extended 8 to 7 time frame. Um, so just want to make you aware of that. Just a little bit of a change. So we'll be kind of playing that by ear a little bit. And then one other quick announcement. I know we've got a lot to talk about today, but the on September 27th, National Capital. Uh, Dahlia Society is going to be having a Dahlia show at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Arlington. So I um, just wanted to give you a quick look on that. Well, I tell Did you, there's a lot them going off? on. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. There's a lot going there on. There's a lot going. There's always a lot going on. Exactly. In you know, Center. and the dahlias are spectacular, right. and like I said, all those workshops are great, and uh, we definitely hope you can take advantage of all that. 
But the most important thing you need to do right now is get your lawn in shape. That's where our priority That's is. That's right. Exactly. Especially so move right that now. to the top of your to-do <laughs> list. And I think one of the most important things as far as just getting started is everything's based on how many square feet you have in your lawn and stuff, and people generally don't have a clue what, no. what it's, size of lawn they have. It's probably one of the, the biggest misunderstood things, and I, I always tell people when I give presentations, Dave, one of my neighbors thought he had a two-acre lawn. He had about 15,000 square feet. Two acres is, <laughs> is close to 90,000 square feet. It yes. makes a difference. So you need to get out and do a little effort to walk around your lawn, and there are apps now that we can use that are on the uh, your smartphones to get this information. Go to the web and get uh, you know footprints of your lawn so get outside and, and get this information so you can make smart decisions on how to apply your fertilizers your chemistry and your seed exactly it doesn't have to be exact you can just pace it off but i i like in my classes and seminars i'll just ask people can you guess how big this room is and and you get everything from yeah. 90 square feet to 90,000, like you said yes yes and, and again it's you assume that you could guess pretty close but you can't and that's what i told my neighbor two acres? I said, that's a football field. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you don't have a football field for a lawn. So you got to know how big your lawn is yeah. to make informed decisions about what to apply. It's right. nice to know that there's an app out there too. That, there are lots of yeah. them. And again, mm -hmm. with things on the web now, there's lots of options for you to do some things and get some pretty accurate information. Great. Yeah. Well, we got a couple pictures here to get the conversation going. Great. Let's see, I have our first picture coming up here. Yeah, so there it is, and it, it can be that simple. So think back to your days of, uh, you know, in the, the high school classroom and measuring areas, and you see just this little simple graphic about, you know, how do you measure the size of rectangles, squares, circles, et cetera. And as David said, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you need to be in the neighborhood of what to do. So it's that, it's that simple to go out and spend a little bit of time, and you can pace this off and do pretty accurate measurements. I'm just going to jump in and say also on our website at MaryfieldGardenCenter.com, we have a garden products calculator under the help button and it has these equations to help you measure up your regular areas of spaces and stuff and you can just pop that number in and that will convert it to how much top dressing you need and those kind of questions. That's a huge, so, huge help. So that's also a good place to get that information. So you measure up, kind of figure out what kind of area you have to work with and then where's our next step? Our next step is, and I wouldn't be a good extension specialist if I didn't say soil testing. <laughs> you just have to have a soil test in order to know what's going on in your lawn because again how do you know what to apply if you don't know what's in that soil? So what we're seeing here is a shot of uh, a soil probe that's taking a sample down. We'd like to see at least three inches and if you could go down to four to six inch depths. Take 10 to 15 samples, mix them in a plastic bucket, and you put them in about a half pint box and that's what you send off to the lab to be tested. You're going to get the recommendations back from that lab on what to do. Yeah. Now this is, um, we have these available at, at all of our garden centers also, but this is basically, it's a form that you fill out that, you know, put your name and address, a little bit of lawn history in there, a little sample of the soil goes in this box and you mail it down to the soil testing lab. Mike, I tell you, this is amazing. I had a customer that submitted a sample of last Saturday, so that was over the weekend, and by Wednesday he had his results back. Wow. Yeah, it's a great time to do it now. The yeah. labs aren't super busy, so they can turn these things around quickly. And now that customer is ready to make some big right. moves on the And that's lawn. where the email response and yes, everything, it is. but it's great because then you get that uh, soil analysis. And as I always say, then your fertilizer recommendations are custom specifically for your lawn rather than following generic guidelines. It's the recipe for success, first step. Absolutely. There so you go. Definitely, it's a good starting point. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a quick break and come back. We've got some great information on your lawn. Stay tuned. Everybody, welcome back. David and I are with you today, and we've we've got a special guest. But where is he? Well, he's over there, to, uh, ready to give us a lecture. Like I said, we're calling this, you know, lawn lessons from Virginia Tech, because we had Professor Goatley with us from Virginia Tech, and he's going to give us some cues on getting our lawn into shape. David, here is we're looking at a lawn that has obviously had a, some damage occur to it and we're talking about the fall. One of our first things is in regards to the fertilizer that we are using on lawns. And a lot of people ask me these days, what happened to that middle number that's up here? You see 19019 in this material. 
This fertilizer is phosphate free and this is part of what we're trying to do now to improve the environment is use less phosphorus fertilizer if it's not needed because it's a problem with the bait. So we get this material, we look at these three numbers across the top, 19% nitrogen, 19% phosphorus, 19% potash. People always say, how do I know how much to apply? We're telling folks right now we want them to use about seven tenths of a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. And the way they calculate that is you take what you want divided by the percentage of what you have. In this case, that would be 19% of either the nitrogen or the potash. And that's what you need. So if we take seven tenths of a pound divided by 0.19, we get 3.7 pounds of, ni of this 19019 fertilizer per thousand square feet. That's gonna give us our target goal of seven tenths of a pound of nitrogen. So that's how we do this. It's, a lot of this information is on our Virginia Cooperative Extension website as well. If we go to the next slide. This is our seasonal nitrogen totals table to give people a sense of how much nitrogen do you need on a seasonal basis because again, you can do too much of a good thing. And I've got here the charts are showing tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, Kentucky bluegrass, and look at the emphasis here, which is on fall fertilization. September and October are our prime months to apply nitrogen to cool season grasses. And for those of you in Northern Virginia that are growing Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, we don't want you to apply any nitrogen right now. All of our seasonal totals, which you see down here at the end, two to three and a half pounds, one to one and a half pounds, those are the seasonal totals of how much nitrogen that we need. But fall is a prime time now to be uh, fertilizing the lawns, especially in the cool season world. If we go to the next slide, please. This is that renovation tool that we're talking about when you're going to prep that lawn. When you see something that looks like this, hasn't killed the whole lawn, but something has happened here, whether it was a chemical misapplication. In this case, it actually something ran out of that mulch. We've got to get inside here and we've got to do a little bit of scratching and tearing because when we seed this, we need good soil to seed contact in order to get this germination and this uh, successful seed establishment going. So make sure you get in there with some piece of equipment. And I think that'll be what comes up next is what we have is a vertical mower or uh, a little gardening tool here, which you can use on small areas. This type of mower spins down into the turf and it actually brings the material up. And this makes a great seed bed because again, what we've got to do for success is to create soil if to seed contact. To you can rent these types I'm of pieces of equipment typically at a, a garden rental store. And in one afternoon, just a few hours, you can certainly make a big difference. This is also called a dethatcher. So if your lawn needs to be dethatched, it's got a lot of stemming material on the surface. This is a type of machine that you would use for that. And notice the, uh, the little picture there, the inset, the garden weasel. Again, small areas, anything you can do to rough up that base is certainly going to make a difference to get the seed going. Okay, we'll move ahead, please. Choosing good seed is certainly key to success here. And we've got lots of choices in Virginia in which we can grow. And I always tell people, darn it, we can't grow any of them very well. This is a handful of some turf type tall fescue seed. And when you're purchasing seed, you want to make sure you're buying quality material. So again, don't be hesitant to pay a little bit extra more to get really good seed. So we've got some seed labels here to show you what some of these different types of grasses are that are commercially available. And if we can show one of these. This one is coming off of the Merrifield shelf. This is called Tough Play. And you see in this mixture, it's got probably what is our state's most popular turf grass that we grow, especially as seeding installations. And that's turf type tall fescue. And this particular grass has uh, three, four different types of tall fescue and just a little bit of blue note Kentucky bluegrass. And we like to have a little bluegrass quite often in these mixtures because that gives our lawn a little bit of recuperative potential because of the creeping growth habit of that grass. This is one of those lawns that if you've got kids, you've got pets and you look for something that really holds up well to traffic, this one does a pretty good job because you've got the fescue in there, which is a very durable grass and the blue grass that has quite a bit of recuperative potential. The other things that you look at on these labels is look at those germination columns that we see here, the percent germination. Everything that I've got here is basically 85%. Sometimes we'll see things up to 90 and 93%. My rule of thumb is to try to find seed that's at least 85% germination. And we've also got things on here that are important to you about what was the testing date and try to find seed that has been tested tested within the last calendar year to ensure that you've got really good high quality seed. So there's lots of information that we have available on seed tags and again it just takes a little bit of time to look and to know where to look to find this. If we go to the next shot, this one is the shady lawn grass mixture and again lots of uh, folks as their lawns mature their trees start to grow and they start getting more and more 
uh, uh, shade from those trees and shade and turf simply doesn't mix. So we start looking for grasses that are better adapted to low light situations. In this particular combination, we see here a hard fescue is a major player here. Hard fescues are one of a group of fescues that we call fine leaf fescues. They have the best shade tolerance of any of the grasses that we can grow in Northern Virginia lawns. And what we've done in this combination is we put together a very fast germinating grass, which is perennial ryegrass, okay? And again, we've added a little bit more of that Kentucky bluegrass to give it that creeping potential. So I've got a lawn here, which the ryegrass and the bluegrass will do quite well out in the sun. The hard fescue is gonna dominate in the shade. And again, everything we're looking for is still going to be this 85% or greater germination. And our last slide, if we'll go to this final one in this segment, this is your sunny lawn grass mixture. And the sunny lawn grass mixture, we typically will emphasize more Kentucky bluegrass because Kentucky bluegrass is a full sun turf grass. And Kentucky blue is probably one of the prettiest grasses on the planet, but this is one for more of you that are saying, hey, I really want to work, want to spend some time in the lawn. Bluegrass does require a little bit of extra attention when it comes to fertilization, when it comes to irrigation to really keep it looking its best. But this is the, the, the kind of what I would call the premier, I really want to take care of my lawn. Okay, the sunny lawn mixture, which has got Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass in it, this material is going to work well if you really are into it. Now I'm gonna to toss it back over to Debbie and Dave. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Goatley. Yeah, yes. that's great information. And, and what happens a lot of times, even down in Virginia Tech, Dr. Goatley and his colleagues, they're researching and, and testing, evaluating all these varieties, mm -hmm. but we're taking all that information and mixing and blending it, Right. you know, based on that. So I feel like we really have a, a regional seed mix uh, because this is based on the Virginia, Maryland data and everything. So we're putting our bags specifically uh, for use in your gardens here in DC, Maryland and Virginia. Right, so we're working closely with Virginia Tech on all of this. Absolutely, so that's the tough play, the sunny and the shady. Absolutely, well we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna bring Dr. Goatley back over with us and we're gonna get more information on building a beautiful lawn. Welcome back. We've got Dr. Mike Goatley with us today, and thank. Uh, welcome back to the uh, set rather uh, than the it's virtual good to be garden. Back at the set. Yeah. <laughs> Did want to mention? I forgot to mention when we were when we were first on. We will be taking your phone calls later on in the show. So if you have any questions on your lawn uh, for Dr. Goatley or for David or for both of these wonderful gentlemen, save those up. Uh, about the last 20 minutes of the show, we'll take those. So I just want to let you know about that. We'll we'll get that. Uh, so don't call now. Don't, <laughs> don't call now, yeah. uh, but we'll do that later. But before, first, we've got some more great information. We're going to show them a few more shots here. And this is a lawn that was sprayed out, uh, so they removed all the vegetation. They prepped it. We've seeded it. And now you see that this gentleman is applying some straw. And uh, straw is a great mulch. Now, Mirrorfield sells some other products, which are really nice because, again, straw is going to introduce some wheat or some barley or rye seed. And you can get materials that have seed enhancements already in there. But this is one, if you don't want to pay a lot of money, get some good, clean wheat straw, not hay, and use this as a mulch. And about one bale per thousand square feet is what works great in order to give enough light and moisture down into that canopy to get that new seed that's out there to get going. And when it's time to uh, mow the grass, you just chop the straw up and put it right back down into the canopy. Now, Mike, you just kind of jumped right in and said they've already prepped this. I, I want you to back up a step okay. on there because I think the soil preparation is probably one of the most important steps in this whole process. Absolutely. In, in the previous segment, I showed the picture of the vertical mower that we use. But now sometimes you might have to get a tiller and really get in here and do some disruption down to three to four inches. But the main thing is when people go out and just essentially introduce seed into existing lawns, very little of that seed makes it if you didn't do some type of preparation to get that soil to seed contact. So this is one, this site was actually completely tilled with a small rototiller to about four inches deep. The fertilizer was applied according to the soil test, seeded, and now they're putting the mulch on top of it. And this is what it looked like at about 10 days after seeding. And when you put the seed down, one of your first, the first things to remember is that we take our standard deep and infrequent irrigation for mature lawns and totally flip that around and we go light and frequently. And you'd like to keep this seed moist, but not saturated. And if you can do that for the first 10 to 14 days or so after seeding, this is what's gonna happen. So that lawn is well on its way. And if you do this in the fall and another few weeks, it's really gonna look good. And it seems like there's always some little patches or spots that just don't take for reasons I've never had an explanation for. 
So you want to get in there and I always tell folks, hold back a little bit of seed just in case because there will be these patches that won't make it. Do a little more scratching on that area and prep that one more time and try once again. And if the problem persists, consider taking a soil test on that area alone and submitting it separately and figure out is there something more serious going on here that we just don't see. Yeah, because it is aggravating. You'll do everything completely uniform, do a great job, and then for some reason there's just always a little work. patch that's not here. Yes. But that's, that's part of the process. That's true. This shot is showing um, our uh, recycling mower, so it's a mulching mower. And I have this little unit here, was a very inexpensive one, but to me, that's probably the best investment I have for mowing my lawn. And we want people to understand that if you can recycle those clippings right back in the lawn, that's essentially is fertilizer for the turf because clippings are nothing more than the same nutrients that we've been applying. We figure we can make about 30% of our seasonal fertility requirement simply by returning our clippings. And the other thing about mulching mowers at this time of year is don't hesitate to use these tools to simply chop up the leaves right back into the canopy. Uh, not a lot of nutrients in those leaves, but there is a lot of organic matter. And research out of Michigan State and Purdue University has shown that essentially if you can get the mower over top of the leaves, that's fair game to mulch right back into the lawn. This is my compaction testing device, and I think this might be a little exaggerated. It's very high <laughs> tech. I used to use a kitchen knife until my wife found out <laughs> I was taking knives out of the drawer. So I went to a screwdriver, and my rule of thumb is that if you can use a screwdriver and push it into three to four inches uh, depth without having to really, you know, smack it, beat it down in the soil, that soil probably doesn't need to be aerated or to cord. But again, a lot of our soil sites here in Northern Virginia are highly compacted. So take a screwdriver and probe a moist soil and see how deep you can go. And if you can't get down to three inches, it'd probably be worth spending one of these beautiful Saturday afternoons to get that piece of equipment and start aerating that lawn. And I think there it is. Yeah, there's our shot. This is our sports field manager down at Tech. This is Emerson Pulliam. He's actually aerating the entrance and exit area uh, for the football team, which gets all the heavy traffic. It's the same thing in your lawn. If you've got kids or pets, there's going to be areas which get compacted. So he's got his machine out there running, trying to open this soil up because we're trying to get more oxygen down to feed these roots and to feed all those uh, beneficial microbes that are down in that soil. And this next shot kind of shows a little bit about what's going on here. You see the cores on the soil the holes that have been created. Uh, again, if you could get deeper than this, that would be great. But this is pretty typical of what we got sometimes. And if you've gone to the trouble of renting this machine, then what you'd want to do would be to run that thing multiple directions over the lawn and not just stop with one pass because here's one chance to really do some great things to get that soil breathing again, improve the health of that grass. And if you're going to apply fertilizer, if you're going to apply seed, all that works well in conjunction with core aeration too. This picture is showing what probably should have been completely tilled, but it shows what the benefits of that coring uh, effort are. Everywhere you see the little uh, circles of grass there, that was where a core was pulled. And so when I was asked to come visit this site, my assessment was they probably should have tilled this area because it was all compacted, but you can see the, the value, the benefit of punching those holes in the ground and getting that seed to come. And let's see what's our next picture. Oh, and these uh, final shots. This is one of our ongoing trials down at the university. This is some research by one of our graduate students, Adam Boyd. And Adam is working with uh, composted biosolids coming out of Northern Virginia. And so we've got this trial at our Turfgrass Research Center in Blacksburg. You see some different color responses here. This is turf type tall fescue. Now the, the darkest green plot that you see over to your right, those actually are synthetic fertilizer and irrigated. Uh, plots. The ones that are less colorful, uh, but actually the ones that we really like the best in terms of uh, what we're getting in a response are some of the plots where we've incorporated two inches of compost in. The color is very consistent, very persistent. It's never the darkest green, but it's always a consistent green. And when the drought that hit Blacksburg uh, early this year, when we didn't get rain for about six weeks, it really stood out in terms of the compost greatly improves their quality. I think we got one more picture. Oh. Nope. Guess we don't. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break and we've got more information. There's always more information on the lawns, right? There is. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, we're getting some lawn lessons from Virginia Tech today with our guest, Dr. Michael Goatley, and uh, we've been talking lots of great information. 
Lots but there's, of stuff. But yeah. there's even more. And don't forget, we're going to continue this at the seminar. Once, once the show's over, these guys are going to just run out of here and get to our Maryfield location. So it'll be lots more time for even more information, in-depth information, and, and lots of questions. So. Yeah, and it's great seeing all this research. It actually applies to this stuff you can put to work in your in your real life at home and everything. So all this work you're doing with the the uh, organic matter, the biosolids, and working them into the soil, you know, getting the best varieties and all this, uh, all this ultimately is going to help in terms of preserving our environment and and a good way to also recycle some of the waste Exactly, products. there you go, recycling. And uh, two words we hear all the time, recycling and sustainability. How can we make our lawns more sustainable? So that's exactly. a big part of our effort. So everything from shredding your leaves and grass clippings to using some of the you know, waste products in the soil, all this is just fantastic stuff. Now probably the, the thing I'm getting most of the time at the plant clinic right now is people coming in with weeds. Right. The things have crept in during the summer. So let's start out the segment with this. Okay, and, and this was always going to be a major topic is weeds. And we've got a slide here showing a really healthy crabgrass plant. <laughs> and uh, that one is kind of creeping along the edge here of a lawn and a path. And a lot of people saying, well, when you get into September, I still want to spray this. And it's a, a difficult question to answer because could you? Yes. Should you? Yeah, that's debatable. But if you have just an entire lawn of this, say, I want to do something to eliminate crabgrass, we do have a product that the trade name is uh, typically used as Drive, and quinclorac is the active ingredient there. That material can be applied uh, pretty safely and then seed uh, soon after it's available. That's one thing to pay attention to if you do start trying to treat crabgrass so late in the, the summer that you might get into situations where you can't do your seeding. So for most situations, I tell people, hey, this crabgrass is going to be dead within about a month because a frost is going to take it out. Go ahead and prep that site and seed into this and let Mother Nature control that crabgrass on our own here in the next month. But we go to the next slide, I'll show you the type of weeds that you really should be focusing on now if you want to get weed control in front and foremost. And that's, uh, the fall is a great time to control perennial broadleaf weeds. And this is primarily a dandelion patch that was in a lawn in a very unmaintained piece of property there near Blacksburg. But you get things like dandelions, plantains, and clover. And I'll say a little bit more on clover in just a second because clover is the beauty and is in the eye of the beholder. Some people want clover. But dandelions and plantain, now is a great time to get these plants. Uh, in the fall, cool temperatures, still warm soils, you can really get great chemical control of these perennial broad leaves. And plus all of our other desirable plants in the landscape are probably as tolerant of, of any of these materials that we'd ever have. They're not really nice and succulent like they were back in the spring. So emphasize fall as a time to control these broad leaves. And I said I would say a little bit more about clover and we'll show you a picture of some research that's going on between uh, Virginia Tech, University of Maryland, and Penn State. And we're evaluating that tiny little plant there on the right. And this is micro clover, which is essentially a very miniature version of our traditional white clover that we quite often see in lawns. And for some people, they consider clover to be an objectionable weed. It has a small white flower that a lot of people tie into chains or whatnot. It certainly is a benefit for bees. Uh, do you want it, do you not want it? Well, we're looking at it as a, an amendment to add to seed when you're establishing lawns because clovers, uh, they're legumes and they fix nitrogen. And that, again, when we talk about sustainability, we think we can probably reduce the need for synthetic fertilizer if we can add a little bit of this to the lawn. So my next picture is a shot from the research plots out at the University of Maryland. And you see this combination of tall fescue and micro clover, and, and we did a little uh, trial. We asked participants in a recent field day to evaluate these plots. And uh, it was funny to watch how, uh, especially the husbands and wives, uh, most of the wives came through and said, that looks great. And the husband said, I don't like that at all. We have to get <laughs> rid of that. So again, you know, it's that beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but uh, I didn't find this objectionable. Uh, we do emphasize a lot in lawns about uniformity, so it, it typically takes a person with a different mindset to say, well, that's a good looking lawn, but again, I don't see anything wrong with that, and there is nitrogen that's being added back into the soil from that material. And we'll move forward. This was, uh, I hate to say this, but this was my lawn, and fortunately <laughs> not this year, this was last year. And uh, this is what goes on in terms of, uh, we get visitors during the night uh, that come in search of food. And uh, these are skunks that came and paid me a visit overnight and they're looking for white grubs. 
and we are still in a window of opportunity to treat for grubs with insecticides this time of year because these are they're fairly small right now they'll be heading deeper into the soil but if your lawn has ever looked like it was just ravaged with a shovel overnight you probably have had skunks show up in feeding so you definitely want to try to deal with this and I tell you David I had some great soil to seed contact there when I came back in putting that seed <laughs> down again and I'll show you some more insect activity and this is a recent picture a friend of mine from Richmond sent this and that lawn is not dormant because it's Bermuda grass or because it is uh, a drought that is what happened after fall armyworms just absolutely marched over that lawn and consumed the foliage and hence the name armyworm they just show up in mass and take over that grass is going to recover but it went from being a beautiful lawn to just one that was essentially browned out and the next picture shows actually what this critter looks like and again, this worm, you'll see them out there and they feed 24 seven. They don't care about time of day. They've got an upside down inverted Y on the top of their head. And that's one way to identify them. A lot of times I tell people just observe them. If they're not causing a lot of damage, let them do their thing. But again, that lawn we showed the picture is probably one in which they wish they had treated. Last two things to show you my slides. The Grassroots Initiative is out of the U.S. National Arboretum. That opens October 16th. It's a great exhibit to go out and see all the benefits of how a, a turf grass benefits the environment. So again, U.S. National Arboretum, grand opening October 16th. It runs for four years. And my last shot is one that if you're into social media, if you'd like to know more about kind of the things that the tech team is seeing, we have a Facebook page called Virginia Turf and my Twitter feed is at VA Turf. I post everything I think of. See, I'll probably try to post today's visit here on the, the set to talk about what we're doing. All right. That's great. Fascinating. I want to tell you, it's just been uh, lots of great information, but this can be your opportunity to give us a phone call. Absolutely. Uh, if you have any detailed questions or specific to your lawn or, or just want to share some of your own experience, we'd love to hear from you. 703-387-1046. We'll be back in just a minute. to some of your questions if you have anything you'd like to ask us 703-387-1046 and gentlemen our first caller is Ann who's calling from Springfield hi Ann good morning how are you good thank you good what can we do for you this morning I'm calling because I have a lawn that is impacted and all it is is full of weeds and moss mm. and we're going to try and uh, do it we were going to wait till the spring but I'm learning that it's probably best to do it now, and how far into the fall is it still okay to do it? Oh, I'm so glad you're watching today. <laughs> what do you have to say for Mike? Yeah, Ann, that's a great observation. What we want you to do is to really focus on a fall fertilization, a fall soil testing we talked about, and definitely you've got basically another three to four weeks, and I'd feel pretty comfortable uh, going up at least until the second, third week of October. Sooner the better would be desirable here, but get those soil tests done and then uh, loosen that soil, that compaction soil, and uh, then make a selection of what you think is going to be the best grass for your situation based on what we talked about earlier. Is it sun? Is it shade? Is it traffic or not? But you are absolutely right about move your calendar up and work on it this fall. Okay, it's um, shade. My, my uh, lawn is in the shade because of a lot of trees. Okay, so if you're in the shade, then what you want to look for is some of the grasses, uh, grass seed that has the hard fescue or one of the fine leaf fescues. And there are three categories of fine leaf fescues. They're called creeping red, chewings, and hard fescue. And these are the ones we use the most in the shade. No grass is really shade tolerant, but that category of grasses are the most shade um, tolerant that we have, if that makes sense, because all grasses would like to be in the sun. But look for that, and that would be the best type of grass to plant. And again, any time between now and mid-October would be ideal. Thank you. My, law, my area needs to be tilled. And now, so if we till it and all those weeds come up, do we kill them off first? That they are going to come up because when you till the soil, you're going to bring a lot of seed to the surface. If your lawn is basically one of those, you say, oh, this is just a start over, a do over, I would go ahead and spray those materials out. When you say you have moss, that makes me suspect it's probably either, uh, it, you said compacted, it's compacted, it's wet, and it might have a very acidic pH. 
So get that soil test done because you're probably going to need some lime and incorporate all that lime and fertilizer into the soil. And if it really is nothing but a weed patch right now, yes, I agree. I think I'd probably spray that material out and just start over from scratch. And then expect that you're going to have a few weeds this fall and you could still treat for those, but you want to wait until you mow it the first three or four times to make that application. And, and I'm going to say you can pick up a soil test kit at any Fairfax County library or at our garden center. Uh, try to do that today and then when the results come back, bring it in to us at Maryfield Garden Center. We'll help you interpret it and get through all these steps that uh, Mike was talking Absolutely. with you about. Thanks, Thank Dave. you. I have one other question. <laughs> when I put my bulbs down, which I'm going to do this week, I have a lot of deer. So I'm planting mostly irises and um, allium and all those ones. Um, should I lay something over so the deer won't get it, like underneath all the new soil I'm going to put on? No, I was, and I would say a lot of the bulbs you talked about are generally considered deer resistant, but if you're planting tulips and crocus and things that the deer browse on, you can use a product called Bobex um, and basically soak the bulbs in that or dip them in that, let it dry, and then plant them. But putting a cover on there is not really the best thing, but you, some of these repellents work quite well. But Great. thanks for watching and calling, but uh, we've got to we move do. on. Yep. Thank you so thanks, much. Dan. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Okay, John is calling from Fairfax Station. Good morning, John. Uh, good morning. How, how are you today? Good. good. Um, I have a question about mowing after seeding. I've always been confused about that because they say not to mow till it's three inches high, but if the new grass is three inches high, but if you do that, the rest of the grass will be 12 inches high, and you put your blade at three inches or more anyway, so you wouldn't be cutting new grass for a while. So uh, yeah, You're not alone <laughs> with that, John. What, what do we do, Mike? Well, John, you definitely, I think you want to mow when the grass needs to be mowed, and I know that sounds simple, but don't let it get away from you. And we tell people to keep that one-third rule in place, which you never want to remove more than a third of the leaf blade to prevent from shocking that plant, because when you scalp grasses, you basically shut down the root growth. So I tell folks, as you're growing in new seed, you have to keep that lawn moist, and your biggest concern with mowing is typically getting the equipment out there and making ruts and footprints and things like that. So get that grass up and going, and it reaches that three inch, four inch height, then by all means, get the mower out there, but allow the soil to dry out to where you can either step on it or you can get the equipment on, and then keep that one third rule in place. So if it's three inches tall, it's fair game to take it down to two inches and keep doing that. And the more you mow it here in the fall, the thicker it's going to become for you later on this fall and again next spring. Okay, well, you, are you talking about a new lawn then or a renovated lawn or both? Any of them still applies. And fall is a great time to keep mowing, especially your cool season grasses. And the more that we mow them now, you're going to encourage what we call tillering, and that's where new shoots are formed. But this rule applies really to either new establishments or you know renovations or existing lawns. But a lot of people let new establishments basically turn into a hay field and then come out and scalp it down. That's not beneficial. We want to mow the grass when it needs to be mowed. And once that germination is that far along that you should be cutting, dry that soil out and start prompting those roots to explore deeper into the soil to extract water from further down. So it's more a problem of, uh, of, of compacting it with a lawnmower? It will compact, but again, if that soil is appropriate moisture, so you know you don't want it to be too wet to where you could see that you're leaving tracks out there, but allow it to dry out enough to where you feel comfortable, whether it's you standing on it or your push mower, riding mower, sitting on it, that you just simply don't uh, leave any ruts. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay. Let's see. Dan is calling from Baltimore. Hi, Dan. Good morning. Good. And thanks for taking my call. Sure. My question is. How do you get rid of Poa trivialis in turf type tall fescue? We have it everywhere around here and all the research I've done on the internet. I know they may be coming out with a new chemical, a chemical called Poa Cure, but how do, you, how do you take care of that? Dan, great question, and the answer is move. <laughs> because there is no way to do that yet, but you're right, and you've read uh, up on the, the new POA Cure product, which my colleague Dr. Askew is working on. There are some experimentalists currently in evaluation. We just had a field day at, at Tech. We're looking at some of that work, but the chemistry that is being evaluated right now is not commercially available and is not labeled for that use. So you have, are spot on on a major problem that my weed science colleagues are furiously working on, but we do not have a solution to POA Trivialis just yet. Okay, now I, I have read some on the internet also there are some people saying they've had some success, not a lot with uh, a chemical called tenacity. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that in your research? 
not in terms of uh, consistent poa trivialis control. Uh, again, Dr. Askew is working. If you'll check our Virginia Cooperative Extension website, we're posting updates from the field day that include some information on tenacity, but still not quite what I think you're looking for. All right. Okay. Well, I thank you very much, and go Hokies. Thank you for calling. <laughs> there you <here>. go. <laughs> Thanks for the call. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of your phone calls. Okay, our hour has flown by. We've got this last segment, so we're going to quickly get to Nick, who's calling from Tacoma Park. Hi, Nick. Hey, good morning. I've been waiting for this show. All right. Uh, All right. <laughs> now, this is my problem. My wife has two fig trees that she wants me to plant, and she wants me to plant a rose garden. So, for my backyard has moss and weed, you know, in the grass. So, is there a grass that's going to uh, complement the uh, rose garden and the and the fig tree? And that also is going to get rid of this moss. So what? How do I get rid of this moss? And, and is I'm using the shady that that you have. I'm going to get the Merrifield shady. So is there is that best for it, or should I use a combination grass? Well, I'm just going to jump in real quick here and and say, Nick, I I feel like you know plants they're competing with each other, and grass is a pretty aggressive competitor. Mm -hmm. So you know I I say you want to create different beds and actually create a garden bed for your fig and your rose and then that can be surrounded or a part or adjacent to a lawn area but I'd rather keep them separate. But that, that's my two cents. I want to hear what you've got and to say. And I agree. Mark. I agree. And, and I think probably Nick that again the biggest challenge is certainly those trees. You know that. And what can you do there to to make this easy, there is anything that's going to be easy. When you say moss, I typically think of poorly drained soils, densely shaded, and again, it might be acidic. And the moss itself, you probably need to do a really good tillage event and then try to get as much of that material that's out there. A lot of people try to spray moss out with Roundup, and moss is quite Roundup tolerant. So uh, attempt to correct the soil compaction. I agree with David about establishing separate areas. The shady mixes that contain the fine leaf fescues are the best choices that you have to use there. Don't be surprised if this isn't a situation that you have to address uh, you know, annually uh, every couple of years or so because again, when you start mixing turf and trees, the trees are gonna win because they're getting a lot of the water and they're definitely getting most of that valuable sunlight. But that would be how I'd approach this. So get a soil test done, prep that site, and try to remove as much of that moss as you can. Okay, so. I got it, I got it. So, but what kind, what type of grass would I start to plant? It would be the shady mixture. So again, look for things that have hard chewings or creeping red fescue. They're called the fine leaf fescues. Those are our most shade tolerant varieties in the cool season plant world for turf grasses. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next caller is Tom, who's calling from Ashburn. Hi, Tom. Hey, good morning. Yeah, I'm good like the morning. previous caller waiting for this uh, show. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm a hokey dad, so go Hokies also. But I got a couple of questions here. Uh, I did jump the gun and I started putting down the compost that uh, you know David recommended on the front lawn. And what I got was a couple uh, burn spots. And I'm just wondering. I know when I'm shoveling it, steam comes off. So I don't. Is that something uh, permanent, or <laughs> or is that just going to be a, a temporary burn spot? Yeah, that's going to be temporary. So Tom, it's going, you're going to see a rebound and probably actually going to see a very beneficial response uh, that's coming from that. So yeah, don't worry about that one being long term. We, in that one of those trials I showed early in those photos, we actually had received the same type of response when you're going out with a pretty heavy application of that material. But no, don't uh, sweat this one. I think your lawn is actually going to benefit from doing this. And in, in a few weeks time, a few days time, probably you're going to see a beneficial response. Great. And then, and also, I've been watering it, trying to get the seed going like twice a day, once you know in the morning, and then once later in the afternoon. Is that right? Uh, That's right. Just quickly, and then, and then, how about the uh, uh, doctor? The the height of the mower. I have set it three and a half. Do you alter it and raise it during the hot summer and then lower it in the fall, or what would you recommend? Well, you, for? you've just said it right there. You want to, uh, as going into the summer, the taller you can set the mowing height on the fescues, the bluegrasses and ryegrasses. When I tell people, when we hit uh, into Memorial Day, please start raising those cutting heights and grow that grass as tall as you possibly can through the summer and stay off of it when you need to. Now as fall arrives, we totally reverse that and I tell folks, go ahead. Uh, if you like mowing grass like me, I'm kind of crazy like that. I like 
like to mow lawns. Uh, now I mow it quite frequently, and I'll try to mow my lawn two times a week to keep that one-third rule in effect. So you said it's spot on. Mow the grass regularly now. You can mow it down the lower side. Most cases, lower side would be down about two inches. Let it grow to three inches and keep doing that two to three rotation. And then in, in the summer, as high as like uh, four or five inches? In summer, the higher the better. And our major limitation to getting higher is basically safety issues and concerns with the mower deck and the discharge. But set those mower decks up as tall as you possibly can during the summer. And that's going to promote you having as deep of a root system as possible. Okay, one, one final quick question. The clover, my neighbor and I, uh, we both have it. And we're in a school that we don't like it. <laughs> Should we address that now or wait to the spring? And what commercial product would you recommend? Then. Now would be the perfect time to do it. And typically what you're looking for are products that have two and three way combinations of our standard broadleaf herbicide. So you would th see things such as 2,4-D dicamba, 2,4-D dicamba, MCPP are kind of the common names of the chemistries we have, but it would be a standard lawn and garden broadleaf herbicide. And usually your labels on those herbicide products will show pictures of things like dandelions, plantains and clover. So pay attention to the pictures as well and it probably give you a clue. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you so much. We had a couple of other callers. Uh, my apologies to Helen, uh, Nick, and George. Uh, I know Helen had a, a bulb question, but we've only got about 30 seconds left. Any quick well, tips on bulbs? All I can say is we have bulbs in stock <laughs> and it's a good time to plant them. Absolutely. And I'm sure Peggy will be talking about that a little bit next week. Absolutely. Okay. Well, when we, again, these gentlemen are going to leave here and go directly to our Maryfield location for the seminar. Any tips on what you're going to be talking about? My tips is going to be the key word because I'm talking about my top 10 turf tips, the things that Goatley says I think this makes the most difference. And that's what we're going to cover. Do these 10 things, I think you'll have a better lawn. That's great. All right, we hope to see you there. That's right. And next week we'll be talking about container gardens, so getting your landscape spru spruced up for the fall season. So we hope you have a great week. Come by the seminars and uh, come by and see us at Maryfield Garden Center. We've got everything for fall. Have a super week. Take care.